Um, and then some of Mark's concept work. One thing, you know, Tony Baxter, I was speaking with him a little while ago, and he told me Mark Davis' work is interesting in the fact that he, it had no crutches. He said lots of the artists he's worked with over the years, when they're developing concept art, they gotta put a little person in the front, kind of point and say, oh, look over there, that's the joke, or, you know, like, check this out. But Mark would only draw things that you were gonna see. Like, he knew exactly the effect it should have on the, the viewer without having to show you like this is how it'll be in the in the attraction. So uh, this this is an example of um, a, a scene that he had envisioned for the Haunted Mansion. Um, and Alice, you want to explain <laughs> what's happening here? I know that you, uh, can you explain this picture, Alice, to us? It's oh, it's oh, that's right. It's the tiger. Oh, that's one that's. One of my favorites. It's the great hunter. Yeah. And he has his, his tiger there. And he has parts of it. Instead of putting it just gold, he has like the tail hanging there. What? And then he has uh, the rug coming up and biting him from the back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just all different types of things that you wouldn't think a person would do. But it's funny. And that's what Mark, how Mark would work. He would go into all kinds of, of uh, information and books and things on tigers. He would come up with that. Yeah. And then we're showing him now that the ghost in the library taking a bath. <laughs> yeah, the brilliant of uh, Mark's uh, drawing was not only the, the uh, macabre kind of uh, humor that's very subtle. That he, he just inherently understood. She explained he could make a drawing of a gag with only two or three little notes about this goes here or that does that. He could walk that drawing over to uh, Maple, which was the division of the company that we manufactured uh, all the animations and, and different kinds of creatures, and just simply hand it to one technician. That one technician would take a look at it. And in a week or so, he's got this whole thing built with all the animated moves and everything in it. You didn't need any technical drawings. You didn't need any engineering of any kind. Uh, nobody between Mark and the guy building the gag. Mark had come back over and looked at it and said, yeah, that, that's what it's supposed to do. It was so efficient way of work, and Mark was the only guy that made drawings that you could immediately understand the gag, and you could actually build the gag. The ones doing that love to have him come and play. <laughs> and then he'd say, uh, I remember it this time. He would say, uh, Look, boss, we got it closer this time. And every time he'd come in to see it, he would come and look at it. And before he could say anything, they said, This is the closest we've gotten yet, huh, boss? <laughs> And they were very proud of it, and they wanted the drawing left there for a few days so everybody could see the drawing and how close they came to his drawing. Well, it was easy to do because his drawings made sense right from the get-go. You didn't have things that were uh, far out or things that were had uh, too much extra gag in it. It went right to the heart of the essence of the gag, and everybody could understand it's so simple. He was very good at that. I, I think he was the best at staging things. So here's uh, Mark's concept for the uh, seance. Um, this one, a little bit more, uh, possibly a little more grand, a little more serious, and then there's another one, maybe a little more <laughs> later. Um, and uh, the cat, of course. I don't know. I don't know if this is when they were considering having if the cat's just a, a character in the scene, or maybe when Exitensia was thinking for a while maybe a cat would be your your guy for the mansion. I'm not sure either way, but uh, some ideas he had for that. And there's another drawing. I like the cat. <laughs> Got caught up in the whole uh, the whole spell there. So. Um. And then here's. Uh, some of Mark's concerts for the ballroom, um, Dancing Ghosts, you know, where that kind of well, the, the end result is pretty literal, Dan Ballroom, Dancing Ghosts, but uh, maybe, maybe those are the Dancing Ghosts up in the corner. And then this, uh, there's, there's, 
There's, <laughs> there's a grandmother knitting in the ballroom, but this is Mark's uh, idea that who, who knows exactly what relative of hers she was knitting for. I'm not sure. Someone with a number of arms. And then so yeah, you can see, and this one is a little bit more uh, not so funny and a little bit more intense. So his sketch is really to run the, run the gamut. Um, uh, you know, when he was considering things. And then here's, so this is what Bob was talking about. Like he would just write a little, a little note there. This is what happens. And um, you could tell exactly what, what we're supposed to be seeing in the, uh, in the gag. So this is another ballroom gag he had. Someone just dancing on the chandeliers. So now we'll talk about the bride a little bit. Um, um, this, I believe, is the first bride that was installed in the Haunted Mansion. Um, you wouldn't really see her face. And I'm not certain that it was quite so creepy as it might look there. I think it was all painted black. Uh, you know, this is a in the light picture. But, and then with some Mark Davis concepts of the bride. Um, I know, Alice, you were talking to me earlier about the bride. And um, kind of, maybe you can talk a little bit about the, Mark's idea that about the story and the lines and what I mentioned. Well, Mark said that the thing that was most important was to put on a show that you only had 12 to 14, 15 minutes at the most. That you would be looking at something and it would tell you a story. But it had to be a story in pieces and have it work together. So he said most of the time you would only see maybe 12, 14 seconds of a movement or something. And it had to go into something else that could keep the story going, but different. And um, that was what was the problem with the bride, was you couldn't carry the story of the bride all the way through the show for 14 minutes when you only had so many seconds per character to go through. Like looking at the, the uh, uh, bird cage with the, the uh, Kadzooks, I can't remember. But anyway, it was uh, blood in the dish instead of the water. And there was a bone instead of seeds and such for the bird. And, and it had the old-fashioned uh, palm tree that you had in the old houses for decoration. Um, but when you had to go with the bride all the way through, you can't carry a story because you have to have other things going on to keep the interest of going through the show. And um, with the pirates, you had to have them going very quickly, too, because you had much to cover in a short time, so you couldn't do this. So when you've got a, a bride that's sitting there and the room hasn't appeared, and then all of a sudden have it somewhere else for a few minutes, for a few seconds, and then somewhere else for a few seconds. You have to have a lot of stories going with the position she was in to get to the end. So that's why it was was uh, removed and slowed down. And uh, some people liked it and some people didn't, but uh, Mark felt that it gave more of a story. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting that the bride from the very, very earliest uh, treatments, Ken Anderson had uh, ideas for the haunted house. Um, there's always been this bride in some way, shape, or form, and we still have the bride in my imagination. They've kind of gone back and tried to build up her story a little bit with the attic, with the way it is now, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, and you can see from Mark Davis' concepts that he was trying to, you know, what can we do with this bride if we want to have a bride and tell a story in one little quick scene what can we do? Maybe she lost her head. Uh, maybe she's more of a beauty bride. I think this is interesting in the sense that um, you see his sketch and then you see the maquette they built. And um, they are very similar, but they feel very different. You know, it's, it's a little more 
kind of silly, and that one is a little bit more sinister either way. And that maquette is actually the one that they put into the, the attic um, mock-up for the uh, the Haunted Mansion, and I think that's kind of the way they ended up going. Oh, this painting, by the way, the bride walking her dog is also at Walt Disney Family Museum right now. You can see it in person. Um, and I thought this was interesting. I'm not sure if this, if these are supposed to be tied in with the bride or maybe bridesmaids or or what, but they're kind of younger. You know, you see younger girls, one with a flower, one with a doll. I mean, they're kind of silly, but if you think about it. Like, did you, would you want to ride to the Haunted Mansion and see that glowing doll, girl holding her doll? Like, wouldn't that be the creepiest thing in the whole Haunted Mansion on the side of the track? Um, so he had some really, you know, some eerie spots and ideas. So you might recognize this. I think it's, I don't know if it's a dog, a hellhound, uh, something that we find in the graveyard. So a lot of Mark's concepts did make it, uh, obviously, into the Haunted Mansion. And that's, uh, kind of how he was translated in a horrible flash picture which doesn't really do justice to what you see. Hama Mansion is one attraction where it's really true, no flash pictures, because everything looks terrible but it's just a flash in there. Um, and it's interesting, you know, when they were building the animatronics for the uh, Hama Mansion, they decided to just let you see the, the nuts and bolts. I mean, that's kind of a the skeletal look they wanted to use rather than trying to imitate bones and things. They just, uh, you see the nuts and bolts through a clear skin, right? Do you know anything about their decision to uh, to do that? How they came up with the idea to let's just show people the guts of the animatronics? Were you involved with any of that? Well, that's really easy. We used uh, clear butyrate plastic, which is a thermoformable uh, flash sheet material. We started doing that in about 1963. Uh, it's just a standard uh, body part, but obviously, if we build a little uh, armature, a little framework, whether it's animated or not, and you, you build it kind of goofy, and you simply put uh, the plastic parts on and forget to put the fur on it, you got a ghost dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, and then it's just an example of um, another Harriet Burns sculptures of one of Mark's um, concept drawings that actually made it into the Haunted Mansion, the, the ghost band. Um, I think I think every set piece in the graveyard was designed by Mark Davis, I believe. I'm not certain of that, but I think it's true. Um, and then another one of his gags, two characters, the uh, executioner and his victim holding his head in his hand so while they sing a happy song. Um, and then this is interesting, you know, some character designs. Uh, you kind of see a character that kind of made its way to become a, like maybe like the uh, High Fox Ghost and another guy that's a very familiar hitchhiker. Uh, this is before I think the hitchhiking ghosts were totally worked out, but those characters obviously became, uh, you know, our famous hitchhiking ghosts. Okay. And there's, yeah, see, you can see the, uh, the just don't put on any skin and you have a ghost, right? This is just for fun. <laughs> I thought you might like to look at um, a close-up of little Leota. Now, the uh, thing that's interesting about this is that her uh, skin is obviously painted bright green. Uh, in the Haunted Mansion uses a lot of very creative lighting techniques. Um, they use um, infrared lighting, you know, black lights, for a lot of things, but they also use um, incandescent lighting. Um, and I've heard that that's, to, maybe, I don't know if you've heard this or not, maybe you can explain, but I've heard that they did that to differentiate between kind of the real world, the living world, and the ghost world. Have you ever heard anything about that? You know, lighting is very uh, tricky. A, a lot of it goes back to the early days of Disneyland. We had a lot of black light in those days. Because that seemed to be the only thing that would, you know, that really make something look different. And of course, um, you know, that ultraviolet light, you could just do painted flats and get away with you know, something really cheap. But there are certain places that this type of lighting would make a, a difference between uh, something that is literal and dimensional and something that's kind of implied. So that was still a good tool of lighting. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And um, yeah, and I imagine it's probably one of the attractions that uses lighting to the, the most dramatic effect. So um, 
That's the end of my slideshow. So I think we have time now to have some questions from the audience. I'm sure some of you have questions for our digital legends. Um, we're going to um, have you raise hands, and then I think we have some helpers that are going to come up, and they'll they'll they'll, um, they'll select you. And I don't know if we can have the house lights up a little bit because I can't quite tell um, what's going on here, but. Um, Okay, so if anyone has questions, please raise your hand. Researching it for 20 years. I interviewed Alice very much and Mark Davis and several people uh, involved in uh, That's creation of Disneyland and Mark Nash. But I have a very unusual question for Bob And that is about Walt Disney. Do you know what type of cigarettes he smoked? The main one that he was smoking was still bad enough before. The Sweet Cap Well was a Canadian one. And in the year before he passed away, uh, he shifted from these little cigarillos called Eric, E-R-I-K, and that really smelled like a dead rope. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved to slip him a joke that our company plan would have smelled better. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Have another question? Uh, I was just wondering what you know, your thoughts are on the um, some of the different variations they've done of the Haunted Mansion, including uh, like the one in Paris, which is very, very different uh, than the one in, in California and Florida, and, on, and also the uh, the annual changeover to the Nightmare Before Christmas. Do you think that's a good thing for the mansion, or what do you think? Uh, Al, Bob and Al? Yeah, go ahead. Al. Well, if you read the plaque at Disneyland, it says, you know, Disneyland will never be finished, and there's always this uh, argument, what would Walt have done? Well, if Walt had been around, I can assure you, at least from my observation, he would have kept improving stuff, particularly every time there was a new tool to tell a story, new ways to, uh, you know, technology to make stories more interesting. If you just look at just the Haunted Mansion alone and look at the changes in audio and lighting over 45 years, it got better and better and better. There's a lot more clarity to sound. There's a lot more clarity to uh, uh, the visual things you see just due to the much better kinds of lighting that we've got today. In retrospect, it'd be a shame to keep it original with old incandescent lighting, uh, stuff like that would really not good. But what you want to do, you want to keep telling the story the best way you can do it. And if it means changing it and using modern tools, well, so be it. That's what we do. And also, for the other parks, there's certain thematic differences in different countries. Different people have a different takes on the story. So uh, the story writers always take a look at that and see if we need to shift something one way or the other uh, that kind of fits the locale that the story's being done in. Do you, do you want to share a thought about Phantom Matter <laughs> I would like to add this part. Um, I think Walt would have a tizzy over the show in Paris. It was dead flowers, the grass was all yellow, and not very much of it, and the rest of it was just hard earth. And they had a man come out that was over six feet tall with a big tall uh, Lincoln type hat and he would come out and scare the hell out of all the little kids. <laughs> Walt would just about wet his knickers on that one. <laughs> and then you went inside and they did things with the audio electronic figures that they weren't able to do yet. They hadn't moved it far enough. So most of the time you had a curtain closed saying we're working on the figure 
or this we can't run it today. And that's bad too. It's better to go without it until you get it working. Sure. It's like the, uh, the New York World's Fair uh, with the Illinois uh, building was three weeks late opening because they couldn't get even have Lincoln working properly because it had to be done differently from the others. Mm -hmm. And the guys were working day and night trying to get it to work. In the meantime, the Japanese put, um, what are the bearings? Oh, little, little ball bearings. Little ball bearings, big tubs of them on each side because people thought that they were sh putting those not to show what they could make, but to give them to fill their pockets with them and go over to Lincoln. And they throw these, these uh, bearings at, at Lincoln <laughs> because they thought it was a man in a suit. They didn't think it was a man. <laughs> and it covered the, the ground with the, excuse me, the floor of the theater with these bearings and the poor guys would go out to work on the figure to check something and they'd hit these and they'd just go sprawling all directions because there were all these bearings. So I told them just to put their foot in and, and shake the bearings away and then just slide your foot and you won't fall. But they didn't do it and they kept falling and sliding that back and they injured from it. So we finally went over to Japan and asked them if they'd please stop. We definitely need to do a panel on the making of uh, great moments with Mr. Lincoln. We oh, have a lot of stories to tell here too. Um, Alice, um, I think one thing I think is interesting about Phantom Manor, uh, maybe, is that they did go back to that bride and they made her the whole story. So uh, you know, it's just a different thing. It's interesting. You know, I I see what you're saying about how the the, the grounds are not pristine and clean anymore. Uh, like Walt had said for Disneyland. So I think we're just going to do next is to we're going to go get uh, Tony Baxter, who now that he doesn't work for the company, can speak freely. And when he comes back, and have him explain why did you do screw it all? We got any more questions? Any more questions? Thank you so much for being here. This is incredible. <laughs> Can you describe the early control systems that were used for the animatronic characters? Were they electromechanical? Were they tape? Anything in that area? Well, if I start to explain that, we'll be here a week from Tuesday. <laughs> Constant change, and we use the new tools, everything we could uh, learn, we constantly applied to our show control systems to the point that by 1971 and 72, we had our own system called DAX, Digital Animation Control System. We did that for a number of years until we found that uh, the rest of the industry was coming up with their own control systems that were lighter, simpler, and you could simply buy them. Nowadays, most of the stuff that we use is, is, is pretty much uh, you know, this store-bought stuff. But the early, early days, if you really want to know what it was like in 1954, uh, some of you know the story of the little dancing man. This was a little tiny uh, display with a little dancing guy, uh, you know, maybe a thing about a foot high, and it had cables going down to a drum that was maybe two feet that. diameter, and it had uh, cardboard uh, uh, discs and little rollers, all mechanically made. Wayne Rogers was working on that thing every day, and I was sitting about five feet away from him, and Walt would come in about every day, and they'd shake his head, and they were going to get this thing going. I felt so sorry for that guy. This was a piece of junk. That was never, never going to work. <laughs> Walt ruined some kind of animation. Then, within a year, we were doing stuff with a little electrical switches. We even took a... Um, how many of you guys car knows what a Cadillac Optronic eyes? We were using a Cadillac Optronic eye, which is a you know, headlight shifter, and we would use that uh, uh, on the cardboard cams. Otherwise, we had to use aluminum cams. Pretty soon, we got it down to where we could run things on tape. And the big uh, breakthrough was the uh, Tiki Room down at Disneyland, where we put everything on a one-inch tape with 16 tracks. 
Now we had a tape that was not necessarily digital, it was kind of more like an analog uh, signal that we could peel off uh, the signal with a little blue device called a fridge. And that way we could run a whole bunch of devices in sync all on one 16-inch track. But the problem was, if the electric voltage shifted, which was Abraham Lincoln's problem, where the voltage in the, in the park would shift, and if you have a track that says left arm goes up and down, and you shift frequency just a hair, it means uh, left leg goes sideways. <laughs> well, if you can imagine the chaos we went through on the tape with these uh, frequency discriminator uh, fridges, and in, and in New York World's Fair, it really became very rough because Abraham Lincoln would suddenly uh, turn into a spastic and he would kick the chair. <laughs> Maybe we're the only one in the near this guy because he'll, he'll really bruise you pretty badly. But we found out an interesting thing. About 3.15 in the afternoon when this place was being constructed, uh, Lincoln got in a really bad temperament. We never could figure it out. And one day a guy came along and he says, when the guys turn off their power equipment and get ready to go home, the voltage starts going up in the, in the Department of Electricity and New York couldn't control it. So you had this voltage drift. It only takes a minute uh, shift of either frequency or voltage, and it completely uh, confuses these little blue tubes called fridges. So we had kind of a, a fridgeitis that was going on the whole time. And then we saw we put a, uh, uh, we put a, a controllable um, uh, power supply, cancel the whole thing. That was, Lincoln wasn't sick after all. <laughs> okay, I think maybe. Enjoy with it was that when he would go berserk, he was usually standing up and he would sit down in this beautiful uh, oak chair and he'd just smash it to bits. <laughs> <laughs> he'd end up sitting on the floor and the chair was all over the place. <laughs> Uh, we cured that because uh, we had a thing called go home uh, code, which the minute Lincoln misbehaved in the slightest, uh, the program would immediately drop out and a fixed code would go in where Lincoln would go into a position in about a half a second, which was usually like a kind of a neutral standing thing, which means it wouldn't damage anything and he wouldn't look as crazy. <laughs> Hi there, this is uh, probably a question more for Mrs. Davis, but when Mark would come up with these uh, concept sketches, would he ever concern himself with the technical execution of it? Would he worry about, well, I came up with this, with this great story, could it, you know, could it actually uh, come to fruition? Was he ever involved with Yo, Gracie, and, and saying, well, how, how would we do this? Is it possible? Or would you just come up with these great ideas? Thank you. I don't think he asked on how would we, how would we do this. He would say, this is uh, the idea I have I put down here. And I'd like to talk to you in regards to what I'm hoping will come, how you can make this work. And if it doesn't work, I'll come back with and think up some other ideas and maybe we'll come up with what we want or maybe even better. And if something went wrong, sometimes in trying to repair what was wrong, you come up with a better idea and it comes out differently and you'll have a whole new batch of sketches in no time for everybody to see. So it was, it was I think the group, uh, Mark, had great affection for all of the, the workmen, and I think they had for him. Uh, and it was a it was a group effort. Mark would come up with an idea, and they would maybe come up with one that might do it better, or maybe they weren't coming up to the, what he wanted, and he would think that maybe if we did this, it would work better. But when it was all finished, and the finished drawing was there, and, Boss, we've done it again. And that's the best part. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to 
ask each of you what your favorite room or feature is in the Haunted Mansion. What's your favorite, uh, what's your favorite uh, feature in the Haunted Mansion? Oh yeah, it's Alice. She likes all of them. <laughs> no, I think the thing I like the best is the, the uh, cage for the bird with the blood <coughs> and the bones. And the, you know, the old house with all the uh, drapery and so forth, and like the palm tree. I've always enjoyed that because that was from my time, which was long before you were even thought of. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, I really like the, uh, the ballroom scene because uh, I keep my fingers crossed that when the ride breaks down, yeah. it breaks down <laughs> nice. <laughs> we, we, we can twice, and I'm there for about five minutes, and finally I can see everything in there. <laughs> <laughs> I like to take the notes in the mirror at the end. And, uh, I think it's a perfect ending, like just a little Special treat at the end. Take some along. Yeah. 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 Now, so thank you all for coming. Let me. Uh, um, this is self-serving little plug, but I will be at uh, Bill Rude's Seven Hills booth for an hour, signing books. If anyone's interested, um, it's 124, I think. And um, so, thank you very much for coming. Let's have another hand for. Uh, Let there be music from regions beyond.